Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Canope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. When I say that we should be independent energy speaking, it's because I think those big decisions we have to make down the line are important. And we've seen that over the last 150 years, how much the pursuit of types of energy have cost lives. The commissioners needed to have tribal knowledge and understanding of intergovernmental relationships as well as positions being represented by river basins. But it is a struggle. I think Emerson and I are in such a unique situation because we are the swingiest district. So we have the responsibility to probably listen to the majority of our district more than maybe someone who's in a safer seat. All right, folks, uh, today we had a very fun podcast. Our guests were uh, one friend of the pod, Representative Emerson Levy, returning for her second time on the podcast. We uh, interviewed her when she was a candidate and Representative Anessa Hartman, uh, her first time on the pod. Uh, Emerson represents a district in Central Oregon. Anessa represents a district in Clackamas County. And one thing they have in common, aside from being freshman uh, Democratic legislators, is that their districts are incredibly competitive districts, like two of the closest in the state. In fact, maybe the two closest in the state in terms of vote differential between the winner and the loser. Um, And so we had a great conversation. We talked a little bit about their backgrounds. We talked about running in a swing district, um, something that uh, you three have in common, Reagan, is having young children and working in the challenging professional environment of the legislature. Um, and then we talked a little bit at the end about policy and, and um, key accomplishments from their tenure. Uh, Reagan, your thoughts on the episode? I was an ineffective podcast host, Ben, because I wasn't very good <laughs> at asking questions today, but I really did enjoy listening. So um, both Anessa and Emerson have some really um, just different backgrounds, but also similar experiences. And so it was really interesting getting to just listen to them talk about that. And I think that um, are, uh, you kind of think of politics as a monolith and two sides. And we talk a little bit about that, about how there's, there's individual people involved in, at each, um, you know, point, whether it's people affected by legislation, whether it's people advocating for legislation, the people voting on the legislation, the people who implement the legislation, all that stuff has human components to it. And sometimes I think we think of it as, you know, words on a page and, organizations and groups and so you know there's there's got to be a balance of the of the names and the logos and then also the human elements that we deal with um in this business uh -hmm. and i think really ultimately what we learned ben is that well-known quote from winston churchill about how democracy is the worst form of government except for all of the other ones so for all the other ones Mm -hmm. uh One thing I'll say before we jump into the episode is a huge shout out and thank you to Buddy Terry, our podcast producer. There were some technical challenges about 15 times in this episode. So uh, (laughs) if you're listening to this, Buddy has undoubtedly spent a long time uh, making it sound as good as he possibly could, uh, given the product that we handed him. So thank you, Buddy. And in honor of Buddy, do something that will make him happy, which is subscribe to the YouTube page. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you get a notification for the episodes every time they come out. Uh, Buddy is a big proponent of YouTube, and our uh, viewership on YouTube has grown pretty substantially since we launched. Uh, so we'd love to have your support there. If you're more of an audio person like Dragon Canope is, just follow us on whatever uh, audio platform you prefer. And uh, with that, we will jump into the episode. Enjoy this week's interview with Anessa Hartman and Emerson Levy. Now that the legislative session is over, it's time for Oregon's activists, candidates, and political committees to turn their attention to the 2024 elections. With government regulation of political activities becoming more complicated nearly every year, and with political actors increasingly initiating complaints and litigation to achieve political goals, having experienced legal counsel has become critical to success in the political arena. Harang Long PC has represented clients involved in candidate and ballot measure elections for decades. To learn more about Harang Long's political law practice, check out our website at harang.com. That's www.harrang.com. All right, Representative Vanessa Hartman and Representative Emerson Levy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So 
I was thinking about where I wanted to start this conversation. I mean, I think uh, people who spend time in the state legislature know that uh, the four of us are friends. Like we know each other outside of the politics world. And I was thinking, you know, there's the obvious, like we're all of a similar age, um, like young-ish, not super young anymore, uh, as people have discovered at conferences they recently went to. Um, I was thinking about family because all three of you are parents of young kids and I kind of wanted to start there and hear about your experiences being a parent during a legislative session um hi fam also a parent of young kids has been like uh antagonizing me to have kids uh I wish I really do want to have he's been very encouraging actually but I know how hard <laughs> it was for all of you at times so actually uh, uh Anessa why don't you kick us off on that topic tell us about being a mom during a legislative session yeah, I, I think um, there were both there are highs and lows when it comes to being a parent in the legislature. I think, at least in my experience, um, I have a nine and eleven year old, or almost twelve, because she'll get mad if she hears this, and it's like, "Mom, I'm almost twelve. Um, I think I have a little bit of a, a an upper hand because they're older, and so they they understand what is going on. Not always, but we can have those conversations of like, "This is what's going on. Uh, this is how long I'll be gone." But the mom guilt is a real, real heavy thing when you're missing a, a choir concert or a presentation in their classroom. Uh, it, it weighs on you incredibly, but I think it made me work that much harder uh, during that time. Like this is for a big purpose. And most of you, Reagan hasn't met Marley yet, but Ben and Emerson, you've met Marley and you know how mature and wise beyond her years she is and she was always such a rock for me in the these spaces when I was feeling down or feeling emotional about not being around as much as I have been used to being around and she was always like this is just for the better this is for the good like this is so I can have this and da -da -da. and so that part was always reassuring but Miller who's a little bit younger she's nine is was like you're leaving again <laughs> like you're that, you're that mom that can't come to my Mother's Day lunch. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. So it was really challenging. Um, I think I was really grateful, as most people know, and my mom moved out here for the six months. And I, so I think having an extension of just like me, like my family being with them, it had a little bit more ease. Um, but I can't imagine what this work would be like without having help, without having someone. It's, it's incredibly challenging. But we made it work. Um, some days are bad, some days are really good, but it is it is a challenge, and we do have a lot more work to do in the legislature to support caregivers and single parents and parents um, to make this more accessible for them. But overall, it was it was a, a life changing experience. Well, and Emerson, for you, obviously the distance is pretty significant, so you like were not popping home every night to see your daughter. Mm -hmm. What? How was that for you? Mm -hmm. Um, I think Anessa, the the age thing is a is a big deal. So my daughter's eight, um, and so I would say she's probably more aligned with her her nine year old and how she felt really frustrated sometimes when I was leaving, but also did amazing, better than I expected. Really, my whole family rose to the challenge. But just to give background, I left you know practice law during COVID to you know do a pod in my house and all the things. So she went from me being home mm. every single day as a stay at home mom and very active at her school. I was at her school at the time. I was on the PTO to like, mommy's gone like Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday. So it was a really big adjustment. And I think that if I had done it two years ago, it would have been most impossible because she would not have the context to understand what I was doing. But now she does. And my husband, you don't have family help. Um, he has a really busy career and he just took on all the childcare and did amazing. And my mom community here um, just really surrounded us and, and made it possible. But yeah, I mean, I won't say I've never cried in my office for missing something. And I'm missing her ice cream social tonight for a uh, for a town hall. So. <laughs> I uh, think I, I think it's yeah. incredibly. I just want to acknowledge that neither Emerson or I cried with this first question. Okay, so this is, <laughs> <laughs> like talking about our kids makes us very emotional. <laughs> uh, so, kudos to us. <laughs> Reagan, I'm also going to try to make you cry. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but your your kids are really little. 
Uh, and interesting thing for you, we actually talked about this before you were a host of this podcast when you came on the podcast. You also remember being a little kid when your dad was in the legislature. Um, so I'm kind of curious how you have navigated being a parent who is also the child of a legislator. Yeah, that's a, I think that gives a pretty interesting perspective. So I was, um, I think I, so I was uh, three maybe when my dad got to the legislature and then he was there for six years. So like three to nine is where I spent uh, my time, a lot of time community Salem, a lot of time staying with um, my dad's parents or Corvallis. Um, and then always, you know, we have, we'd always have some sort of rental place in Salem. And for some reason it was always so many ants all the time in all of these <laughs> rental houses. And I never understood that. I was like, what is up with all these ants in Salem? They do not have these ants in central Oregon. Um, and so, and then I think, um, my dad left the state legislature the first time because my, uh, sister, uh, Emily, who's just 18 months younger, um, and, I, it was probably a collection of us all at different times, but she was like in tears one day on the bottom of the stairs as he was getting ready to leave for sale and being like, dad, why aren't you home? And so he was like, can't, you know, I can't keep doing it. And so then he took a break and then came back when we were all older. And so it's a lot easier when we're all kind of in our middle high school years to really handle. And of course I went with him to, to work at the legislature and then coming back to work for him again with a four and a two-year-old or a three and a one-year-old when we started, it was a challenge because there's a lot about, I think that the culture at the legislature, because you have that, that compressed timeline of you've only got the six months basically to do your session, they're constitutionally limited. They try to jam so much into that one period of six months. And there's a bunch of folks there, like for better or for worse, who don't have um, lives for uh, or or choose to put their lives aside maybe is the nicer way to say it um, and so they're all go they're always going and so you have to kind of choose are you going to be there all the time and sacrifice a bunch of stuff or are you going to be home and sacrifice being there all the time and probably sometimes that means giving up on some of your priorities and and pushing the things that you want because there will be other people in that space pushing your priorities and um, not as big for me as a staffer, but I imagine that that impacts a lot of a lot of lobbyists, a lot of legislators, a lot of advocacy groups. And so I think that I, I would really like it if the legislature found a way to be a little bit more family friendly in that front, not so aggressively, you know, seven to seven, um, uh, seven to nine p.m. Right. And but I don't know how you solve that, because as long as you have the state legislature that has all of the responsibilities that it does, there's always going to be people asking for stuff. So um, I, I think there's, there's good things about it. Cause like when I brought my kids to Capitol, everyone was always super friendly, but it's a really hard environment for them to hang out, especially during session. Interim's great when there's no one around, but during session, there's just, you know, there isn't a lot of space, especially because of the construction and there's always things going on. And my brain is already in 1200 directions anyway, before I even got there. And then, everyone's like, you know, looking for you and whatnot. And so it, it's a huge challenge. And I don't know that I solved it. My wife is a full time attorney. So I'm in a similar situation um, to Emerson, but we had a little bit more, you know, we had the only reason I was able to take a job is we lined up some child care. If we hadn't, there's no way I'd be able to work um, in the legislature. So yeah, it reminds me of the Ryan holiday, one of my favorite authors has uh, he writes about this. He's like, work, family, and scene or like social life pick two you can only have two you can't oh, have yeah. all three mm -hmm. and like reagan i know you you went home i mean actually all three of you guys were basically i think you pretty clearly chose work and family uh over the social scene i felt lucky like i uh stayed down in salem i could go to the receptions um, i came home when i wanted to and when i didn't feel like it but it's one of the things that has me like not worried but just i know that my life is going to change dramatically uh and it seems hard <laughs> the thing that uh emerson and anessa can identify with that i cannot thankfully uh and reagan cannot is running as a candidate whose name is on the ballot in a swing district where hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent to defeat you and hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least ideally, hundreds of thousands of dollars would be spent to elect you. Uh, Emerson, you've done this twice now, running in a swing district. Um, you've also ran in a swing district uh, with a, a family, with like young kids who are like watching the mean things people are saying about you. Um, and who, you know, 
thankfully in your situation who got to see mom get elected and now everyone calls her representative which i imagine is its own cool thing um but tell us about the experience of of running in a highly competitive swing district i think you two are like the two swingiest swing districts in the state closest margins yeah so the very first time i ran in 2020 you know i did not have any expectations of winning that seat um, it was just an opportunity to really to learn and, you know, frankly, make some mistakes when no one was watching. And I don't think that I could have won my race without that experience. I ran against Jack Zika, who I really only have kind things to say about. And um, our race was very different than my than my second race. And then the, so the second race, it was a in it to win it. Um, unfortunately, the there was a lot of other races that um, were were not as close, but still needed money. So um, that's just kind of how it goes if you're a pickup rather than um, a seat that the party's trying to save. So I had a lot of money spent against me, uh, just not a lot of money <laughs> to get all of my message out. We did a, I think we did a really great job with what we had. What's your um, thesis? As far... oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, what's your thesis on how, like, usually in, in politics, people think about, like, the most money wins the election. It's not always true. Um, there's definitely outliers, but money clearly was not the the main deciding factor in in your race. What is your thesis for why you were able to be successful in a tight, highly competitive district? I would give a lot of credit to the Deschutes Democrats who have just ran um, an incredible um, ground game for years. And so we, I mean, we just hit almost every single door and then sometimes we hit it more than once. And so uh, that ground game is free. I think that there was a big difference in the election cycle as well, because the races that you were running in Portland were so different than what was happening in Bend, where people mm. were really pretty happy with how things were going. Um, I think the issue of choice helped, um, luck, and I think the seat was maybe a little bluer than, than people guessed. Mm. Uh, Anessa, what about you? I know you had a, a very challenging <laughs> campaign experience. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you could say that. I think um, to go back even to the primary, you know, I, as mm. as you all know, uh, I was um, not a contender. I was an, an, a no one really, um, a sort of a surprise for the Democratic Party uh, and had a really contested primary and so my experience with running in a contentious district really started then um, when you sort of see how the operation works. You know, we're not, you know, Democrats specifically don't want to support one Democrat over the other and, and you know, in certain situations like that. So it already started off as a little, you know, and so going <laughs> into this, <laughs> going once, once I succeeded in the primary, going into it, it was like this flood of support that I never knew I was going to get. So it was complete opposite of actually what Emerson experienced because I was a very targeted district where I got inundated with people I've never met before. Uh, I have no idea whether they'll trust you or not. And, you know, and I, I come into this space um, not ever wanting to, to do this. This wasn't in like a dream or a five-year plan. And so when I received all of that, like, this is what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're going to do it. This is how we win. I pushed back a lot. And it was like, I'm a single mother. I work full time. I grew up really poor. And this is how I'm going to run this campaign. And sometimes that didn't always go over very well. And so there were two parts that were really challenging is me getting to understand like the system and, and how campaigns work. And, but also me sort of to Emerson's point, while we might be in the metro urban region in the tri-county area, Gladstone and Oregon City do not operate the same way as Portland mm -hmm. and as the rest of the metro region. You know, we are, you know, for lack of like better words, like we are rural. Like this is how we operate as small town politics. And so for me, it was all about like connecting with the voters, knocking on doors versus fundraising, which as we can all imagine, doesn't go over well for some people. Uh, and, but for me, that was the important part. Um, both myself and my opponent were brand new to this. So we did not have the name recognition. I had slightly more of a name recognition because I was a Gladstone city councilor. Um, but that is what I was focused on. And, 
when I was a counselor, we went through a lot of issues, um, whether it was with really far right wing individuals, you know, calling me a domestic terrorist or calling me like the Antifa leader, like that's the fun one, it's a joke now, but at the time it was really challenging to go through because it wasn't me that was just being affected, it was also my kids and my family. And that carried into, carried into this race, um, but I felt more emotionally secure where it wasn't as offensive, like we were prepared, we, you know, we took steps. I'm not saying that it wasn't, you know, challenging at times, but, I think that was one of the most surprising things and and I'm trying to like mull it over and how I'm going to approach it the next race is really, you know, how awful we talk about one another during campaigns. Mm -hmm. And then and then when we win and then we we get all together it's like nothing ever happened, right? And so those were challenging, you know, it was challenging for my daughters to like pull, you know, hit pieces out of the mail with their mom's face on it saying that I'm like this evil person or their parents that the kids that they go to school with their parents talk to their kids and you know there were arguments that they would have in fifth grade right like so like kids are paying attention more now too so it had a lot of effect on like family life and and the way they sort of see the outside world which i think is the most frustrating right like come after me all you want but it ended up trickling down and i don't think a lot of people understand that piece like when we're campaigning and people are out there like actively like demoralizing your character and not such like respectful ways. Like we can disagree on things, but um, that it, it ends up affecting the mental health of your kids in, in a way that um, I wasn't prepared for by any means. Um, and so that was rough, you know, but, you know, we knocked almost as many doors as we could, you know, we, I think they actually out fundraised us, um, maybe not by a lot, but I was one of the top like five targeted races. And so we, I did have, I did have a lot of support. Um, a lot of folks came in to help. And I think the other thing that I'm really prideful of is a lot of our volunteers had never knocked doors for a candidate ever. And I think that was one thing that I wanted to focus on is that I'm someone who never knocked doors for a candidate, you know? And so it was like, I want to bring in more people that were like me. And, and that's really what, what, what we did to win. Like those 181 votes that I won by are, are because we had community coming out. We had moms with like their strollers knocking on doors. Like that mm. is the reason why we were able to be so successful is really like coming together in that point. But I would be lying if I said I was looking forward to the next one. <laughs> Not something one I'm big, looking forward to. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things too that I, I think about, I don't have a solution for this because I don't, I'm, I'm not a solution person here. I'm just an idea guy. <laughs> um, no, I just, my thought about it is, it's like when you think about the folks in Salem whose job it is to figure out how much money they can raise total, figure out how many candidates they can recruit total and working the whole state essentially right they have to view the whole state they have to make the hard decisions about where money goes and which races are targeted and the resources right it is hard to do that and i don't i don't think necessarily they approach it wrong but it is hard to take in the human elements of the different campaigns and how your decisions are going to play out on human levels because sometimes they're just not going to be popular um just like you said uh anessa about you making decisions about how you're going to run your race that weren't you know, popular with how people in Salem do it. That's a common occurrence where candidates want to try something different or they don't feel like something fits their uh, personality. And so they want to do something different that they often ruffle feathers with kind of the establishment funders and the, and the folks who run the campaigns and whatnot. Similarly too, sometimes those folks in charge of the organization uh, organizing uh, all the races and keeping all the races and trying to keep as many races in play as you can and whatnot, you have to make decisions that are hard that people are going to second guess and Monday morning quarterback you. And you have to make those decisions with the best interests of the whole sometimes instead of individual candidates. And those are always, it's just the hard thing about politics is, is some people forget. I think that it's also a business. It is a, it is people at the at the base level but then there's also this upper layer of who's going to be able to move an agenda and getting things accomplished and you have to make hard decisions at that level too and so it's really hard to make those two things fit together in a way that makes people happy and i also do agree with the the strange cognitive dissonance of being able to work with people in the capital go out and fight on the campaign trail and then come back and pretend like it didn't happen 
which I always thought was weird. I thought, I think it's fine to acknowledge that things happen and we all like piss each other off or whatever, whether it was in the Capitol or on the campaign trail. I think it's weird that we shouldn't pretend um, sometimes. I think some people think that we should just pretend things didn't happen. Um, but that's also a balancing act because you got to be able to work with people across the aisle, but then you also have to go and run campaigns and those things don't always um, go together. So I, I think that those are just some interesting observational things. And I don't think that there's necessarily solutions for them, but they're just, it's, it's weird to think about them and how weird of a, how weird of a business this is. Yeah. That's super fair. Were you going to say something? Oh. Or that was Emerson. Sorry. No, I just had, um, Anessa's story made me think of, you know, when she mentioned, um, other parents and kids, that was the hardest part for me too, because I can take it, but my kid is young mm. and, uh, I was really nervous about how it would affect her and like what, what would her friends think about me, you know, what they're seeing on TV, um, you know, cause I've always, you know, I'm like a safe person. I'm, I'm Jay's mom, you know, and that felt really very, that was the most vulnerable point for me, but it kind of switched when my friend told me and several friends told me that their kids just didn't buy it because kids are smart right? Kids are, mm -hmm. kids are intuitive, but also one, my favorite story is one kid went and got a rock and she was going to throw it at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> to defend your honor, basically. Yes. 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 <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, this is interesting because like, I, I think, you know, one thing I admire and appreciate about um, both of you is I think you were two of the leading proponents of like reaching across the aisle and trying to build relationships with the other side. Um, and like to Reagan's point, the system is built on like after the session's over, we go back to our communities and we say, this is what we passed. This is what we did. This is why I'm running for the next time. And someone else says they passed the wrong things. The outcomes aren't good enough whatever and like we're supposed to litigate that fight in a demo small d democratic system and then the voters elect the person but i think the the hard part is like you know the like anessa's antifa attacks like those are just bad faith like those those aren't based in reality no one believed those were true <laughs> including the people who published them um and when when things get like that that's when it it, it makes it really hard like if, if someone campaigns against you uh, the person who campaigned against me in a safe district, not trying to compare, but like he did do like a little mini attack mailer, um, but it was basically about how like I support affordable housing, something along those lines. I was like, okay, <laughs> true. I do support additional affordable housing. That's easy to kind of reconcile with at the end. It's the personal stuff, which I know both of you experienced to weird degrees in your districts that like, it's, it's cool that even after that, you, you were willing and interested in building the relationships on the other side. All right, Anessa Hartman, you, I believe, are the third Native American person ever to serve in the Oregon State Legislature. Is that correct? That is my understanding. That's what I've been told. So we the hear- The first First Nations, though. Ah. Oh. Can you- First First Nations, yeah. Can you explain <laughs> what First First Nations means? So in Canada, we identify as First Nations. So here, Native American, uh, but in Canada, which is where reservation is currently, um, present day New York is where my people are from, but um, mm. there is First Nations. So the First Nations to be there. <laughs> so we hear the phrase a lot, representation matters in politics. Um, and usually that's referring to like having different identities, represented at the decision making table i'm curious what your experience being a native woman in the legislature like was that was that identity prominent in how you like legislated or how you thought about your agenda or in how people treated you um or was it a kind of a secondary identity like how how did it impact your role that is a great question um let's see if i can get it into a small amount of time um <laughs> So I think at like any point in time, like as soon as I wake up, it's like, I'm always an indigenous person. Like my, like the way I was raised, like my values, my morals, the way I look at things, the way I, you know, again, like wanting to bring people together rather than dividing this, like putting a line in the sand, all of that is like at the core. And so I would say that 
I was more challenged to remember where I came from being in the legislature than anything because and like often have to like go back and like read some teachings, like re like recenter myself and reground myself because I could find myself getting lost in the shuffle of sort of this what we would call like a colonial mindset, you know? And so I think it always drove um the way I looked at policy and making sure that um, you know, questioning everything. Like that's the job is like we question everything. Um and I think that really led a lot when I was looking at, you know, certain bills, you know, like this, the ODF and W bill 3086. Um, looking at examples of like that of like how is this policy, especially when it comes to land use or climate or environmental, um, how does this affect our tribal partners? And I I don't want to say that I was surprised. I guess I wanted I wanted to be I wanted to be wrong at how Mm-hmm. Um, little we interact with our tribal partners, uh, but we have a lot of work to do um, in terms of creating stronger working relationships with our federally rec- not only our federally recognized nine tribes, but just anyone who identifies in that way. Because as we know, there's hundreds of you know tribal partners that are in the state or in the Pacific Northwest that are not federally recognized. I know that is like what what I, you know, verbatim from someone we will not name, you know, it's not our responsibility to talk to anyone else but the other federally recognized sides, or even it is not our responsibility as state legislators to consult with the tribes because that is a governmental role. That is a, that is their role. So there was a, a lot of, um, there were a lot of hurtful moments. I mean, I think there were um, really angering times that I would drive home and it's like, what am I doing, right? Like I honestly, there would be times I was like, I really, feel like this is a waste of my time. Like nothing is gonna change. It was very defeating sometimes. Um, from people that I thought, from people, let's just say from people who have, you know, on their websites or in their signatures, what lands they're on, right? Like you really don't know anything about working with tribal partners. And that part was really disappointing to see that like performative, you know, activism when it comes to like, yes, we need to acknowledge this. Okay, and then what are you doing? So that part was really challenging to see it and like be in the thick of it. And I'm very grateful to have had Representative Sanchez there um, and be able to be someone that I don't really have to explain myself or explain my background. Like she just knows. And, you know, we look across the room and you just make an eye contact. You're like, oh, I'm like, calm down, you know. And so that was I don't know how she's done it alone. Um, but that part is that part is challenging. I think that there's a lot of still a lot of misconceptions in 2023. Um, about, you know, indigenous people, Um, you know, you guys would all be surprised and maybe not surprised at the amount of people that were like, oh, hey, I know so-and-so from, you know, Klamath Falls. Do you know them? It's like, no, we don't all know each other. Okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Like, there would be that. Or the, like, classic, like, oh, yeah, you know, like, my great 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 uncle married this native Cherokee woman and so I'm whatever whatever and it's like okay cool what are your traditions and so (laughs) while like those things can like roll off my shoulder it's like I have tried to educate folks like in a way that it's like hey like that might be a little offensive to some people um but in the way of um other young native people um that part has been keeping me going where um, we'll do small workshops, you know, offline and, and they're sort of inspired to continue. And it's that part of representation matters of like, while I'm struggling and hurting sometimes, just the moment of seeing now two uh, Native figures is huge for the community in a way that maybe I didn't, like, it didn't really understand when I first started or when I had a bad day. Um, but these past like two months of meeting with people from across, across Oregon and across the country, because there's only 200, 220 uh, elected native people uh, in mm. state legislatures across the country. And so that community too has become so strong where now that that's growing because it's really for us just across the country more meaningful. And so that part keeps me going and I'll let the sort of microaggression talk slide sometimes, but um, it's challenging, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not easy, but um, it has to be done. Emerson, what was your experience being a Jewish member of the state legislature? Yeah, I think that is kind of a challenging question to answer because there's so many different ways to practice Judaism and so many different types and communities um, of Jewish people. And so for me, I would consider myself a reconstructionist or reform um, Jewish family, which means um, more on the 
more identify through the historical context of being Jewish rather than being like religious. Right. Hmm. I don't keep kosher um, th- things like that. I don't cover my hair and I think I, I dress modestly, but I don't dress the standards of orthodoxy modestly. So I can only speak from my experience um, as, you know, a Jewish woman who maybe doesn't necessarily like present as like an Orthodox Jewish person mm-hmm. um, or who definitely doesn't present as an Orthodox Jewish person. And I think it would be a different experience for someone who physically presented that way. But I, I think it's as Anessa says, like um, it's really important that we have different viewpoints. Um, so for me, I think really where maybe even surprisingly being, being Jewish comes a lot, a, a lot for me is in the energy space because for me, and I look at my family history of having to um, escape between me and my husband, our families have fled the Russians three times in the last like a hundred and something years. So, and it, you know, the Russian regime, I never want to say the Russian people, right? They're, they're just as victims as much as, um, as other people are. But so I can not, not say that's a lot of knots that energy is security, right? It is. And I know sometimes people say that that's a Republican thing to say, but when your like family and people have been wiped out over oil and energy decisions, how can you not see it that way? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just a different perspective um, that you bring just based on your background. And I think the Jewish background is kind of unique in the fact that it is a lot of um, like global, global issues of just of, of survival or global issues made around energy and when you look at the decisions Germany is being forced to make right now with purchasing Russian oil, um, those are tough decisions to make, um, and they're decisions I care a lot about. Um, and so I just want, when I say that we should be independent energy speaking, it's because I think those big decisions we have to make down the line are important, and it, they, they do cost lives. And we've seen that over the last 150 years, how much the pursuit of types of energy have cost lives. And I think... Hmm. And I think that's an important perspective to bring. Hmm. Reagan? Um, I'm just kind of curious for uh, Anessa and Emerson's feedback on this kind of concept, which is a lot of people, and you can go through, you know, the identities that you guys have talked about. Some people go to Salem with an identity based on their work background. They're a farmer, they're a realtor, they're a, a small business owner, whatever. There's almost always two sides or more than two sides to every issue and so you go there trying to represent whatever it is the identity that you you've brought with you to salem or the identity that you have and or a particular aspect because we have a lot of uh of different facets that we bring not just you know who we are but where we came from and what our family's made up of and what our what we do for work and all that stuff so we all bring all that weighing those when they're in conflict often seems difficult and then also as an elected person, you have to weigh the entire community's needs because you represent the entire communities. But there's this, I think some people have this idea that you're either only representing your identity or you're only representing the district and you can't ever do both or you can't ever bring both. And I feel like that's one of those challenging situations where you can be accused of not fully representing whatever it is that you're supposed to be representing or that you said you went to Salem to represent or representing it so strenuously that you've left everyone else uh, out. And I feel like that's the biggest challenge that we have when we clash all these things together in this, you know, supposedly structured form of government we call democracy, right? That I feel like is the biggest challenge that a lot of people face and it's probably specifically extra challenging for for you guys and i don't know if you've got anything to i don't know that i have a question there but it's just something that i was thinking about as you guys were talking so again i'm one of the worst podcast hosts ever so apologize <laughs> for that. but we're you know we're just going to do the best with what we've got here no i think i mean the question in that for me is like you're representing an identity and you're representing a group of seventy thousand constituents and there's got to be a, a balance and maybe sometimes a tension there do you, did you feel that ever? Hard, that's a hard question. I wish, really I, could, hard. I wish I could see it. I wish I could see Emerson's face. Um, <laughs> I, I would say there were moments that I felt that. And, and, and the one that is coming to my, to my head, and 
and it won't be a surprise to, to all, all three of you, <laughs> um, is, is the River Basin Bill, is, is the mm. 3086. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say a good amount of my constituents were completely against what I was supporting um, when I was supporting that the commissioners needed to have um, tribal knowledge and understanding of intergovernmental relationships, as well as the um, positions being represented by river basins. Um, and that was, I would say, the biggest and the most strenuous one that I can think that kind of falls into what you're asking, Reagan, um, because it wasn't just about my identity in that. Um, it wasn't a way because I knew it was, this was a moment for us to show that we're actually listening to our tribal partners and I was going to be that person to explain why. And that was the hard part is that we intentionally responded, whether it was, it was mostly myself or my chief of staff to every single constituent that was like, what are you doing? This is wrong. And it's like, well, no, you know what? I'm, let's talk about it. And this is why. And almost every single time they'd be like, oh, this makes so much sense. This is not what we are being communicated to by whatever lobby is lobbying against this bill. And so um, that part was challenging to be like, okay, like it's kind of scary, like, oh my God, like everyone (laughs) that voted for me is totally against what this is. But once we had the conversation, it was fine. Um, But it is a struggle. I think Emerson and I are in such a unique situation because we are the swingiest districts. And so, we have the responsibility to probably listen to the majority of our district more than maybe someone who's in a safer seat. And I actually, we've talked about this. I think that um, it's actually been a blessing in disguise, at least for me, uh, because it has pushed me to, uh, to, to listen better, to kind of um, see where people are coming from and not just have blinders on, which I think has made me a, a better legislator. Um, and so I, I am grateful for that. I was, you know, nervous about it in the beginning, but it is something that I have found to be a little bit of a, of a blessing. Hmm. Any thoughts, Emerson? I would, I would say I would agree with that, that when you're in a swing seat, you have to fight for everything. And in that you really create this bond or dedication with your district and the people that are in it. Um, Cause you never take anything for granted. You know, and by the time Anessa and I got to the legislature, I had been through, I think, seven debates oh and gosh. you know, just had been really under the, the pressure. And so I felt kind of prepared because I had to hustle mm-hmm. so hard um, that I never, not for a second, do I take this for granted or not think that an, an email from a constituent doesn't matter. Um, it, it is just a different perspective. And I'm, I'm thankful for it. So uh, we have four minutes left, two minutes each. What are you most proud of? What do you, what any accomplishments that jump out from, you know, we just went through this exhausting six month session. Uh, was it worth it? What'd you come out with at the end that made you feel proud? <laughs> um, I, I would, I would say that again, the, this, the river basin bill was a big win. Um, it didn't intentionally, that wasn't my priority at all. Um, I think my my and biggest a, accomplishment is. Can you explain that bill real quick? I don't think people will be super familiar with like what what it did and what was at stake. Um, so the thirty House Bill thirty eighty six uh, changed the way we structure our Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission from uh, congressional districts versus modeling it off of the Oregon Water Resources Commission, which is out of River Basin. So it's a little little wonky for people who don't. Uh, know much about how our water works um, in the state, but it basically follows river basins that each of our areas pull water from. Um, And it hasn't been changed, I want to say, 50 years. It was a pretty big deal. Um, And then the other big deal is that um, if you choose to be a commissioner, you have to prove that you have knowledge of how tribal governments work and have working relationships with um, our federally recognized tribes. So um, that was a big one. Um, But I think personally, what my number one priority was coming into this was the um, campus survivors bill, which was House Bill 3456, which requires all of our college campuses, private, public and community colleges um, to have um, um, advocates on on campus and provide free legal medical advice and amnesty policies. And we were the eighth state to pass that. So that was Hawaii beat us by like one week. We should have been the seventh, but we're (laughs) eighth state. 
um, that was a huge one for, for students. Um, and, and that was uh, one of the more rewarding experiences I had this past six months. And uh, Emerson, I, I think I know what you're going to say. Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Actually, I was going to say something else first. I think one thing that all four of us did really well, despite, you know, we all obviously have allegiance to our party and, and that's important, but I think we all really managed to kind of captain our own ship. And that's kind of what I've done from the beginning of this, especially in a difficult race. It's you, you in your office, you're part of a caucus, but you need to, you know, be responsible for your own decisions and captain your own ship and to, to maintain that. And I think um, all of you have done a really good job with that. Um, obviously, I'm most proud of Alyssa's Law, um, which is the worst acronym in the world it's called SAT Devices, uh, Silent <laughs> Panic Alert Technology. I know it's the worst um, <laughs> in our schools. Uh, and so what it, it's really kind of n not the easiest to explain, but basically on teachers or if anyone who's in authority, phone is an option to automatically connect very quickly um, to um, a, a police or emergency if it's a bad guy event or if it's a kid having anaphylactic shock. Um, you know, the, most, the, 30, the first 30 seconds of an emergency are the most important. And basically, this technology allows communication and enhanced um, response time for those first 30 seconds. And, uh, you know, I always just show the importance of it. If, um, if you've already had this, they would have had a 10 minute warning. And so I just know that this will save lives. And it's that's probably the proudest thing I've ever done. Hmm. What I love about that in, is, oh, sorry, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, Emerson. I was going to say in my professional life, I shouldn't say <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what I love about that is when you were on this podcast before we were actually friends, uh, you talked about uh, Alyssa's law and you talked about um, passing this in Oregon, you campaigned on it and then you did it. <laughs> it's very full circle and cool Yay. that you got it done. Uh, we are at Yay. the time uh, you have to go talk to constituents. Uh, Emerson, Anessa, you've got to go like probably pick kids up from school and get back to your regular lives. But uh, on behalf of the podcast, thank you for making time to come chat and talk to our listeners. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye, guys.